after 10 hours of deliberations, a jury found James Crumbly, the father of the Michigan school shooter, guilty of involuntary manslaughter. And there are five key reasons for it. Let's discuss. I'm Dave Ehrenberg, state attorney for Palm Beach County, a.k.a. the Florida Lawman, here on True Crime MTN. I want to thank you for all your likes and your comments. Please keep them coming. And as far as why James Crumbly was found guilty, let me give you the five key reasons in my mind why the jury did what they did. Number one, he bought the gun. So you could say, he bought the gun, he owns the crime. This is like Hunter S. Thompson's line, you buy the ticket, you take the ride. He's the one who bought the 9mm Sig Sauer. And even if there was dispute over whether or not the gun was was meant for his son or whether the son just found it, there's no doubt that the son at least believed the gun was for him. He wrote about it in his journal and he wrote about it in social media posts. He believed that was his gun, even though the father uh, was supposed to lock it up and try to hide it from him at some point. The the son who ended up shooting, I'm not going to mention his name. He's a uh, quadruple murderer. The son went with the father to buy the gun. So essentially what James Crumbly did was instead of get, getting his son who clearly had mental health issues instead of giving him a therapist he got him a gun and yes even though there was testimony that came out that the staff at the gun store did not see james crumbly turn to his son and say hey this is for you or did not talk to the son while he was buying the gun uh, he should not have replaced a therapist with a weapon and that's what he did when you have a son with serious mental health issues get him help don't buy Miss Sig Sauer. So number two, zero, 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 zero. What I mean by that is that the father was responsible for locking up the gun. Jennifer Crumbly at her trial said, oh, it, that's the father's responsibility, James Crumbly. And there was nothing to doubt of that. I mean, he was responsible for locking the gun up. And how did he lock it up? Well, he didn't. He kept the, the gun in its same case that he bought it in and there's a little lock on it, and the passcode, 0000. He kept that as the passcode. The default couldn't be any easier. And there was a trigger lock that was provided crumbly when he bought the gun, and that trigger lock was kept inside its original packaging untouched. It's a powerful image that came out, and prosecution emphasized it. They even included it in their opening argument. So when you see the video and the pictures of James Crumbly buying the gun and then keeping it in the original case with no security at all and uh, the trigger lock, which could have prevented this tragedy just sitting there untouched. Yeah, that's pretty devastating. Number three, the journals. The killer said his father is responsible. No, the killer did not show up because he took the fifth, so he didn't take the stand. But he did say that his father was to blame because his father ignored him. He wrote journal entries. The journal entries were found in the bathroom at the school, which were recovered right after the shooting. Also, he sent a text to his friend saying that his father just told him to suck it up as when he was having mental health issues. I mean, come on. Uh, so even though the son didn't testify, the son's words were heard by the jury. And here's a sampling of them. First off, I got my gun. It's a Sig Sauer. The shooting is tomorrow. I have access to the gun and ammo. Another one. I have zero help for my mental problems. And it's causing me to shoot up the effing school. He didn't say effing, by the way. It was, uh, but you think it is. Another one. I want help, but my parents won't listen to me. So I can't get any help. And then, as I said, a text that the shooter sent to his friend seven months before the shooting said, I actually asked my dad to take me to the doctor the other day, and he just gave me some pills and said to suck it up. Number four, the killer painted him a picture. Yeah, couldn't be more obvious. The killer draw, drew a picture of the shooting in school before he actually shot up the school. He showed a, a gun uh, shooting. In fact, the text was blood everywhere. The thoughts won't stop. Help me. So the parents were called to the principal's office. And what did the parents do? Nothing. And even though the parents knew that their child had access to a gun, after all, the father bought the gun. 
They didn't tell the school officials. They didn't check the backpack. They didn't even take their son home. I mean, the father had to go back to work. The father was a, was a DoorDash driver at the time. So it's not like he had to rush off to the office. That also is very powerful evidence. So when they say, we didn't know, we didn't know, we didn't read the journal entries, true. That was a good point. They didn't read the journal entries. They didn't know what his son was thinking, but they did see the disturbing drawing. They couldn't deny that. And for them to say, well, the school officials saw it, true. Yeah, yeah, the school officials are being sued civilly. But the difference between the school officials and the parents is that only one of them knew that the kid had access to a gun. It was the one who bought the kid a gun. So when you try to say, well, the school officials are equally to blame, well, yeah, they should be held liable in some way civilly, at least the ones who really screwed up. But there's a big difference between knowing and not knowing about the gun. And then number five, he ran and hid. I know the father tried to come up with some explanation that he wasn't running and hiding, but it was 4.17 p.m. when they were found pulling into the parking space, into the lot of a warehouse in Detroit, and not just pulling in, but pulling in back in where the license plate would not be seen. So clearly they didn't want to be noticed. And the parents uh, had said, well, they, you know, they just didn't want any harassment and you know, people to find them. But the warrant for their arrest, their report, they were supposed to report to jail at 4 p.m. And at 4.17, here they are pulling into the space back in so they don't show off their license plate. That is really bad. That's called consciousness of guilt. You're driving to Detroit to hide out where you hide your license plate, where it's just 17 minutes after you're told to report to the authorities. Yeah, that's, that's running and hiding. And it doesn't look good, especially when your son is sitting there all alone in a jail cell crying out for help. And you did what you did throughout your relationship with your son. Ignore him. The mother cared more about her horses. And the father had his own issues. So that's a really bad look. And it surely impacted the jury. And although that's five things, I want to throw another one in. I want to throw in the fact that James Crumley did not take the stand. I think that's important. Now, that's more of an omission than an action. But I think had he taken the stand, it would have perhaps helped him. It couldn't have gotten any worse. I think that if he had taken the stand, he could have perhaps humanized himself in the eyes of at least one juror. After all, all it takes is one juror, and it's a hung jury if that one juror has sympathy for him and has some reasonable doubt. But this case was never going to be an acquittal. It was never going to be a unanimous jury to acquit him. So I thought the chance that he could have had here was to either take a plea deal, which he didn't, or to try to get a hung jury. But by not taking the stand, he lost a chance to try to connect with the jury. And he did have some areas where he could have received some sympathy. He lost a parent during this time. He lost his job. His wife was having an affair or maybe multiple affairs. So he could have said, unlike his wife, that, yeah, I could have done things differently, but I tried my best. Remember, that's different than his wife, who said, no, I couldn't have done anything differently. I think the reason why he didn't take the stand is because he saw that his wife took the stand and it blew up in her face. But he's different than his wife. He was emotional. He looked like at least he cared. He had blood rushing through his veins. His wife was way cold. But that was their decision. And in the end, they're going to have to live with it because he's going to prison. As far as how long? We don't know. We'll find out the sentencing. But in this case, I believe justice was done. What do you guys think? Leave your comments. Love reading them. And I'll respond as many as I can. I'm Dave Ehrenberg, a.k.a. the Florida Lawman here on True Crime MTN. Thanks for watching. Please like. And I'll see you next time.